Greetings to you all in the matchless name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. My name is Steve Robinson. Would you turn your Bibles uh, to Psalms uh, 31, verses 19. I'm reading from New Living Translation, Psalms 31, verses 19. Your goodness is so great, you have stored up great blessings for those who honor you. You have done so much for those who come to you for protection, blessing them before the watching world. Today, the title of my sermon is Goodness of God. God's goodness is so special and so powerful in each and every one of our lives. God's goodness, talking about God's goodness, his goodness is, is not just being good, but it, it's much more than just being good. His, his love, his, his honor, his honesty, his supernatural power, his, his omnipresent, omnipotent, his love, his righteousness, his grace, his mercy, his loving kindness, and he is a promise-keeping God. So all this comes to the attribute of goodness of God. The first point is God covers his people. When we look throughout the Bible, God covers his people. He gave a promise. He gave a promise to the people of Israelites. He, he gave them a promise that he will never leave them nor forsake them. When, when people of Israel were in bondage, were in, were in sin, were in slavery, God gave them a promise that he would deliver them. He covered them. Throughout, the, throughout their journey, we see that God covered them. He was Alpha and Omega. He covered them in the day, in the night. But still, the people of Israelites were lacking the goodness of God. They didn't know the goodness of God. They didn't know or they didn't taste and see that the goodness of God was on their lives. And his love is extravagant. God's love is extravagant. He covered his people with his glory, with his grace, with his power over his people. Even when they walked through the valley of shadow of death, God covered his people. God covered the people of Israelites. God covered Joshua. God covered Moses. God covered his people with his goodness and with his mercy. And he gave them a covenant. He gave them a promise, the land flowing with milk and honey. His loving kindness is better than love. God's we see God's caring. He is a good, good father to us. He is father to the fatherless. He is mother to the motherless. He is our parent. He, is, he, he said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. I will never leave you as orphans. Throughout the Bible, we see how God used people from the lowest season and he put them on highest positions. We see Esther is one of the greatest examples in the Bible. We see how God picked her up. She was an orphan. She didn't know anything. She didn't have a background. But God knew the hand was on our life. She knew the goodness of God was on our life. And throughout the Bible, we see different people having the goodness of God over their lives. Not just, not, not, not just over their life, but their generations. The generations had the goodness of God. It's, it's, it's so wonderful. You know, God's word says in Psalms 34, 8, taste and see that the Lord is good. Unless you taste, you never know how it, how it tastes, right? So people who really understood God's word and understood his love, tasted and saw that the Lord was good to them. Today, I, I, would, I, I just want to encourage you. We might going through this situation the darkness situation but today his goodness his loving kindness the goodness of god protects us like a shield when we taste and see that the lord is good 
He, his mercy is going to flow all the days of our lives. How he cares for his people with his loving kindness, with his grace, with his power. I just wanted to share uh, you my um, small story, which I probably it's an experience, I would say, uh, which in last uh, December, uh, you all went to break, right? I was going to go home to India. And I just went to get a COVID test uh, to go to India. But then, uh, for my surprise, I didn't even expect that. It came out positive, actually. Um, it was it was devastating, actually. And uh, when, I see, when I saw everybody leaving for Thanksgiving break, and I was alone, like, quarantined there for 10 days, I was like devastated and heartbroken. I was just like, I, 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 I was like, Lord, I don't know what to do right now. I'm in an unknown land. I don't know what to do. But I just held on the goodness of God. Lord, even in that situation, I know you are with me. I was there alone in the whole dorm. But God, God was on my side. I really knew. I trusted God. Lord, I have put my hope on you, not on people, not on man. Because people didn't call me to ministry, but you called me. Even before I was created, you knew me. You formed me. You called, called my name. And when I was quarantined there, I get a call from India. My dad's mother, that's my grandmother, she passed away. And I'm like, so devastated that situation is so heartbreaking and i i can't even like talk to my parents like that four or five days i couldn't even talk to them on phone but one thing i knew even when i walk through the shadow of valley of death i will fear no evil because he is by my side whom shall i fear because he is with me so that was the assurance which god gave me so th today i just want to encourage you you know, uh, when we go through situations like that, we shouldn't forget that God's goodness, God's hand is on our lives. And the third point is we have God's consolation. How many of you believe that we have God's consolation? Through his blood, we have redemption. To, through his blood, we have consolation. Through his blood, the finished work of Christ, he died on the cross for your sin and my sin so that we, may, we might have everlasting life. Amen. And his faithfulness of God. In conclusion, I just want to leave you with this. Understanding and believing the goodness of God will bring us assurance and confidence in him. God will show, show, us, up, show us the goodness in our life. We, all we have to do is we have to take a step of faith. Take that risk. Peter took that risk. Paul took that risk. Joshua took that risk. Moses took that risk. He knew the goodness of God was on their lives. When we, when we go from our comfort zone to, to taking a risk, God is going to do great things in our lives. Amen. Thank you so much. Good evening. How are we all doing tonight? For those that don't know me online, my name is Benjamin Foot. I'm from Canada. And today I will be preaching about pretty much you're this we are the children of God. My title is How Who Are You? I will be reading from Romans chapter 8, verse 14. That is Romans chapter 8, verse 14. Because those who are led by the Spirit of God are his are sons of God. Just want to take a minute, stop, and 
Think about that statement. I'll say it again. What, what you think, what you think you know about yourself is not necessarily true. What does that mean? Well, we don't. Well, the, what do? A lot of times we doubt ourselves. We doubt that we're children of God. We can know this by, it says it in his word. I just read one scripture that says it. And the enemy tries to tell us that we're not children of God. So that's also another way that we can tell that we are children of God. Because if the enemy comes against us and tells us that it's not true, and the word says it's true, it's true. We are not orphans. What is an orphan? An orphan is a child under the age of 18 in most places that lives either in an orphanage or sometimes even on the streets. Both their parents in most cases are dead or have abandoned them. And uh, God is like a father to us. He loves us, supports us, and just we don't have that if we're orphans. We don't have parents that love us, support us, and just believe in us. But again, God is that to us. Are you alone? When we are alone, we can feel... <laughs> when we're alone, we can feel sad sometimes and just depressed, lonely. Personally, I have struggled with this many times in my life. And it's not necessarily that we're in a room all alone. A lot of times for me, it's when I'm in a crowd full of people because I don't necessarily have the confidence to go start a conversation with people. And I'm sure I'm not the only one. But no, we are never truly alone. For the Bible says in Joshua 1.5, I will never, I will never even leave, I will never leave you or forsake you. God loves us so much. He will never forsake us. He literally has his son, he literally had his son come to earth and die on the cross for us. So he could have a relationship with us. How does God help us not feel alone? Like I said earlier, he adopts us into his family. And he puts people around us that talk to us, that come and speak to us, even in the crowds when we feel the most alone. They will just love on us, and they can be brothers to us, honestly, or sisters. And also, being in the presence of God helps us to not feel lonely. Are we without an inheritance? What is an inheritance? We often think... An Often we think an inheritance as something we get from our parents, land, money, most importantly, guns, Bibles. <laughs> this usually happens when our parents go on to and go on either to heaven or hell. Hopefully for Bible college students, all your parents are saved, so
we can also inherit inherit traits from our family. We can inherit eye color, height, and other stuff. <laughs> we also inherit things from our Heavenly Father. Compassion, authority, and power. The same way princes and princesses inherit power, authority from their fathers, the kings and queens. They can also inherit money, reputation, which is good or bad depending on their parents. Now we have an inheritance through Jesus Christ in Romans chapter 8, verse 17. Now if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may share in his glory. Are you loved? In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, 4 through 8, Love is love is sorry love in kind love is patient and kind it does not envy it does not boast it's not proud it does not distort others it does not destroy others and their reputations. It is not. Thank you. Have a good evening. Good evening. Uh, for those of you who don't know, my name is Victor Cruz, and I come from New Britain, to New Britain, Connecticut. Uh, if it's all right with you guys today, uh, I'd like to speak to you on a message that's been put on my heart. Uh, if you would, the scripture is Proverbs 3, verses 1 through 12. Please say amen when, when you're there. And again, I'll be reading out of the NIV translation. My son... Do not forget my teaching, but keep my commands in your heart, for they will prolong your life many years and bring you peace and prosperity. Let love and faithfulness never leave you. Bind them around your neck, write them on the tablet of your heart. Then you will win favor and a good name in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him and he will make your path straight. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and shun evil. This will bring health to your body and nourishment to your bones. Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. Then your barns will be filled to overflowing, and your vats will brim over with new wine. My son, do not despise the Lord's dis discipline, and do not resent his rebuke, because the Lord disi disciplines those he loves as a father, the son he delights in. Amen. Now, the title of my sermon is From the Greenhouse to the Garden. While I was researching this paper, I came across a commentary by the made by the man named Adam Clark. He points out three interesting facts on verse, two, on verse two, and they're all eminent blessings that I believe we all need in our life. The first being Orek Yamin, meaning long days. The second being Shanath Kayim, meaning years of life. And the last being shalom, meaning prosperity or health, long life and abundance. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I'd want all three of those blessings in my life. <clears throat> Sorry. When a seed is first planted in the greenhouse, the gardener has to use a specific soil in order for that plant to grow. If the levels of pH are off, the seed won't sprout. 
and it won't be able to grow into its fullness. On the same level, God chooses where in the greenhouse he places us as Christians. And it just so happens that he placed all of us students here at Faith Bible College. Not by chance, but because this was part of his plan. This was the soil that would help us grow the most. In Mark 4, it talks about the sower's parable. You know, we're all taught about that, about the seeds that land in the different kinds of soils and even the one that doesn't make it. But what if I told you that just being planted in the good soil doesn't mean you'll grow? It doesn't mean that you'll move. It doesn't mean that you'll sprout. Now, this story is commonly told in many sermons for both church and youth groups along the lines of those who land in any other soil, they'll have primarily zero chance of growing. Now, Again, that's just the beginning. Just because a soil is good doesn't mean a crow won't come and try to pick at it. Just because a soil is good doesn't mean thorns won't eventually try to grow under it. What I'm trying to tell you is while we're here at Faith Bible College, God has placed a hedge around us. He's placed a protection around us. This greenhouse that we're in is built and designed to keep the enemy and any predators that would like to harm us away but our seed still needs to be nurtured while we're inside. Our seed still needs to grow. Our seed still needs water. But for us here, we're a special case because every single day that we're here, we're watered by our mentors. We're watered by the word. We have chapels twice a week and church sometimes twice every Sunday. Now, in most places, this is called the greenhouse effect, which exponentially increases the factors in which seeds grow, in which flowers grow. Now, unfortunately, I don't really believe that fertilizer would help us in this situation. But for us, much like plants, our works will never make a single seed grow. Our works will never move a mountain. Our works will never allow us into heaven. What allows us into heaven is God's supplication and the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. We have to allow God to take the wheel while we're inside of this greenhouse. We have to allow God to take the wheel while we go out into ministry, and we have to allow God to take the wheel and allow God to water us instead of us trying to water ourselves. Now, when being planted into a garden and moved out of the greenhouse, the gardener has to have the right tools. Now, there was a quote that says the right tools make working in your garden a pleasure instead of a chore. You don't use a butter knife to chop up raw carrots, and you shouldn't use dull or flimsy tools to work in your garden. Through this, we know that since God has saw it fit to move us or saw it fit to move us eventually from school to ministry, that he knew we're prepared for it, that we have the right tools in our inventory to be able to speak into the lives of everyone around us, to be able to speak into the lives of the ministry that we go into and to be able to grow not only us, but in that ministry, we're we're able to grow that ministry to be able to speak to others. He's already given us those right tools. His timing is never wrong. His timing is never off a beat. Where he placed you at the time he placed you, no matter what comes against you, is always correct. There's always a purpose for everything that happens. Now, although the tools are in everything, the gardener has to choose the right environment. The right ministry for you will be chosen. Now, while researching this, I saw that there are different types of soil that are inside of gardens. There's alkaline, there's clay, which is weird. There's silt, there's rocks, and sometimes there's a mix of all four. But what you have to focus on is does that ministry have a good basic amount of nutrients? Does that ministry have what's going to fuel you? And you realize that it must. Even if you don't see it, it has to. As God's already placed you there, he knows where your roots will spread. Now, isn't it incredible the wisdom that God has being able to place you in the right ministry at the right time for both you and that church to grow? If you move in the favor of God, your spirit, your roots will never be choked out. Now, let me rephrase that. Your spirit will never be choked out. Your life will never be choked out. Now, if you didn't get anything from this, at least hear this. In the garden, most fruits and vegetables need sun. But for us, 
for us as fruits, for us as seeds. We don't need the sun. What we need is God's presence in our lives. We don't need what man can give us. We don't need what that ministry, what the men in the ministry will give us. We need the wisdom that will come from God through those men. We need the wisdom that will come from God through that ministry. Now, there was one thing that I found funny while researching this topic. It said, if you won't eat a crop, don't grow it in your garden. If God wouldn't use us, then why place us in this greenhouse? If you thought God wasn't going to use you, then why move you into the ministry? There would be no point. A gardener does not waste a single crop. A gardener does not plant for no reason. God will use every single one of us in here. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Greetings to you all in Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I'm Jack. I'm from India. And thanks for the viewers who are watching and online. Let's give a word of God an honor and let's all stand up and turn our Bibles into 1 Timothy 4, 14 to 16. NKJV version that I'm reading from. And again, it's 1 Timothy 4, 14 and 16. And I'll read. Do not neglect the gift that is in you, which was given to you by prophecy, with the laying on the hands of eldership. Meditate on these things. Give yourself, underline yourself, eternally to them, and, ye, and your progress and may be evident them. For it's doing this you will save both yourself and those who hear you. And not, and everyone can be seated. Thank you. So in this, the for, the word for means because. Because, and everything that in this scripture, it's all talking not about the past. It's talking about the present and the future that what we are going to do. And what does the scripture really mean? Let's go and see the background of the scripture. And here you can see the Paul is saying to the Timothy like how the end time is going to be. And the end time, how does it look like? The falling away from the way of God and from the will of God. And how can you be saved? Be careful and my dear people of God, let's get back to the word of God. In Matthew chapter 24, 3, it says, and people were asking God. And God says, Jesus says, be careful so that no one deceive you. So this is the end time that we are in and we can see all the things that is around our society and which cause so much troubles and we lost many loved ones and many people are being still. And my total of sermon is save yourself. And how can you save yourself? By giving your life to God. And let me get into the sermon real deep and I just want to share about my testimony like how I was back and I was a bad influencer of doing a different things and led my friends into do sin and commit sin and how many of you you don't have to raise your hand and think how many times you led people to do a wrong direction and you're responsible for each and every person that God puts in your life and save yourself and others many will fall away and maybe false prophet and false teaching will come into your life and our attitude should be 
Lord, what I have to be? And how does the real and the counterfeit will be like? And there you can see how to find the real and the counterfeit. In every area, counterfeit, it looks like very real. Counterfeit diamond, counterfeit gold, counterfeit money, and same as that, counterfeit doctrine, which it looks like same exact good doctrine, but when you watch closer, that's where you will find. And it's so very easy to get deceived by a false doctrine. A very little have a reverence for God and put God first and ask God like, Lord, what I'm hearing, is that from you? Whatever the preacher who's standing in the, in the altar and holding the mic and preaching, is that from you? Ask God. They come, they, the people will go to the church and they will be in the presence of God like two to three hours. And where they have worshiped God, it doesn't even take like one to two hours and comes out and they talk most worldly things that's they, that they should not. Do you think that there were in such people were in the presence of God? And ask God, Lord, guide me what I have to do. And ask God the direction, my step that I need to take further. And be delicate and give yourself. The result of false gospel is people talk, people take sins lightly. Whatever you do, just a lie. And just, oh, God will forgive me in the next altar call. And that's how we, we, we neglect and we don't even care of the sins that we are going to do, that we're doing it. And God, this makes to fade our love with God. And also, and, and the love of God will fade. In 2 Timothy, it says, there will be a difficult time that comes. And everything will assign. And it is a form. Difficult time means it's not financially that the Christians will be surrounded. It is more difficult it makes, it clearly says that it will be difficult to live to be a Christian. Your spiritual gifts still hold on, as Steve said, hold on of God's whole godliness. The form of godliness is a doctrine of godliness. And again, I say the form of godliness is a doctrine of godliness. It's a form, for example, five five ten fingers and two eyes and nose and everything makes a form of a human body the same as that same as such a, for a christianity the doctrine is a form and it and it means people will not preach the wrong doctrine they will hold the correct doctrine and form the godliness but without the power of godliness Again, I say, they will hold the correct doctrine as a form of godliness, but without the power of godliness. Many lose their power when they preach, but they forget the God who brought them into that place. Save yourself so that, so as this, avoid the people in your life that you can see and save yourself and the people who's going to hear what you say. And never try to take God's place. That's what I want to conclude with. Thank you. Greetings to you all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you all for joining us today, today, today evening. 
So I just want to welcome all the online viewers. I'm Joyson. I'm from southern part of India. Let's turn our Bibles to uh, Epistle Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. And I'm going to read from NIV version. Again, it's Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God, this is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. Is good, pleasing and perfect will. So today, my title of my sermon is, Will you do me a favor? So in this passage, when we read, the first, first word itself, it says, therefore. So to understand this, uh, to unlock these two words, we need to see the background and look the chapters before. So in, in chapter 1 to 11, Paul is saying, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, but I'm going to preach the gospel no matter what. Then he's telling, we are all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So we have fall short of the glory of God. So God has sent Jesus Christ to this world to die for us and you. Right? So Christ has died and we are added unto God's family. Now we are God's chosen people. Right? After that, to do the ministry, God has depo deposited the Holy Spirit inside of us. So the Holy Spirit is there. Now what we have to do is that's what it, this scripture is talking about. So God has done so much for us. That's the reason he says, in view of God's mercy. So by God's grace, you have been saved. Now there is things to do for you. That's the reason he says, I urge you. This tells us there is something said that demands something serious attention in this passage. Because normally if people say, I urge you, I beg you, there's something important in that, right? So Paul is telling, I urge you to present your body as a living sacrifice. To present our body as a living sacrifice, it is, in Old Testament we see the lamb was pulled into the altar to sacrifice, right? But in the New Testament, Paul is telling, it should be our volunteer service. It is not by compulsion, it is not by forceful, but we have to submit our body as a living sacrifice to him that is our true worship it is it is not only the part oh today i'm going to submit my will to god rest of the body will act whatever it is no that's not the case he's telling completely submit to god completely surrender that's your true and proper worship so so next he says holy if you offer yourself as a living sacrifice then you have to make sure you're holy because our God is holy. If he is holy, we need to offer ourselves as holy sacrifice. That's what he is saying. The next is saying, pleasing to God. First he said, whole, uh, living sacrifice. Then he said, offer yourself as a holy and living sacrifice. Then he is telling, that will lead us into pleasing for God because we have done according to what God expected us to do. If we please God in this way, he will be happy about us. Not only that, then he says it's true and proper worship. It's good to worship in, in a Sunday congregation or in chapel. But the true worship, he is saying this. And even in, in A.W. A. Tozer says like this. If you do not worship God seven days a week, you do not worship him one day a week. There is no such thing known in heaven as Sunday worship, unless it is accompanied by Monday worship and Tuesday worship and so on. So we worship God in Sunday setting. It's very easy for us to worship. But what about Monday? But what about Tuesday? Are we worshiping God? It's easy to sing God. God, I surrender all. But are we surrendering all to God? That's the point. That's the main point. God has done so much for you. Now, Paul is urging you, Paul is inspired by the Holy Ghost and he's saying, so he's telling, God has done so much thing, but we have to do just one thing. 
What is that one thing? Offer ourselves as a living sacrifice, holy, that will please God. Then if you see the second scripture, it says, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. In this scripture, it is not telling about outerly, uh, out, outward that we have to wear like this. Oh, if you wear this kind of clothes, you are a worldly person. No, that's not it is talking. Because if you see, renewing, renewing of your mind, that's what it is talking about. Now we need to present our minds to God to be renewed. So how do you present your mind and get renewed? Reading the word every single day. Most of the people don't read the word more. But today, as we are living in the last days, if, if people say that you, 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 all the Bibles will be thrown out, what is there in our hands if we don't deposit all the scriptures inside of our heart? So that's the thing. We need to be reading the word, memorizing it, so that our mind is renewed. You are not conformed by this world. No matter what they do, I don't care. They might take the Bible, but the scripture is engraved in me so that I can live by faith no matter what happens. Even persecution may come, but the God's word is the truth that will set us free. So renewing of your mind is important. Present your bodies, present your minds. The next thing we are going to look is present your will. If you don't present your will to God, how are you going to identify what is God's will is? Because you're walking in your will. But if you present your will to God's will, then you will see and approve. You can test and approve what is God's will in your life. It is very simple as it is in this two uh, scripture, but it is like very heavy scripture that it talks about. I'm really, um, really passionate when I was reading the scripture. I was like, wow, this is a great scripture. So it is already, he says, you can test and approve what is God's will is. No, so many of people are not aware how to identify God's will. But if you do the true worship, which is as presenting your body as a living sacrifice, then your mind, then your will, definitely you're walking in the right will of God. That is what it is. Finally, I want to encourage you all to follow the true and proper worship so that you can find what God will is in your life. Thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm just so honored to have this privilege to preach the word of God to you guys. Um, welcome to those online. My name is Jessica, and tonight I'm going to be preaching out of Philippians chapter 4, verse 4. That's Philippians chapter 4, verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. So tonight my title is Again, I will say, so God really just spoke to me to preach about joy tonight. And um, personally, in my life, I've gone through a season of depression. Um, so I came to know Jesus when I was 15 and God transformed my life. But then I still struggle with depression. I would get home from school. And I would just sleep for like four hours straight. And I would just binge eat. And I would just be so depressed because I was surrounded by so much darkness. And um, I went to the altar once and I was like, God, I just, I want to be delivered from depression. And in that moment, God did deliver me. But that doesn't mean that sometimes the enemy still attacks with depression. Honestly, even through this semester... I have found myself just waking up and being like, God, I have no joy right now. Like, I would literally try to smile and I would be like, I'm great. <laughs> and it was so fake. But God has taught me so much about joy. And one of the things he taught me is that comparison steals your joy. Comparison is a thief of your joy. So why do we compare ourselves? We compare ourselves because we try to elevate the places that we're insecure in by looking at other people 
and saying, oh, I'm better at that than they are. And the way to do this comparison is by recognizing your insecurity and then placing the word of God, declaring it over your life. You need to take authority over comparison because it steals your joy. So if you struggle with feeling wanted, then declare the word of God. Revelations 3.20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. You are wanted by God. You are chosen by God. John 15, 16 says, You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit. If you struggle with feeling like you don't have a lot of purpose and you aren't chosen by God, it says in Ephesians 2, 10, You are his workmanship created in, G in Christ Jesus for good works that he prepared beforehand that you would walk in them. God rejoices over you and loves you so much. In Zephaniah 3.17 it says, The Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. He will exult over you with loud singing. Trusting what the word of God says about you will bring joy to your life. Because once you know what God says about you, you won't have to look at other people to try to feel better about yourself. You will be confident in who God says you are. And so do you guys trust God? And so God, do you trust his word? Do you trust this Psalms 37, 4 that says, if we delight ourselves in the Lord, he will give us the desires of our heart. When we are lacking joy, a lot of times it's because, oh God, like I just don't know if I'm going to have the right relationship. I don't know if I'm going to have the right people in my life. I'm just depressed. I don't know if this is going to happen. But God says, if you delight yourself in the Lord, he will give you the desires of your heart. And then you can be thankful for what he has given you. When where comparison begins, contentment ends. Lack of gratitude will, will cause you to be depressed. Where gratitude begins, that's where joy begins. The prodigal son's brother... He saw his brother getting a party. He saw his brother getting all these great things. And he's like, God, I've done so many great things. Why don't I have what he has? But everything the father given to him because of comparison. But as soon as we start to thank God for what he has given us, then joy will spring up inside of us. Gratitude and joy go hand in hand. So no matter what we lose in life, we can say, Jesus, you are more than enough. No matter what we might lose, the relationships, the people, or even a family member, we can rejoice in the Lord always because we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. In Hebrews 12, 27 through 28, it says, This phrase, yet once more, indicates the removal of things that are shaken, that is, things that have been made, in order that the things that cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, and thus let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe. We are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. So no matter what is shaken in our world, we're receiving an inheritance that cannot be shaken. And we, when we have our mindset on eternity, no matter what we face here on earth, we can rejoice always. Um, it's really hard to rejoice when there are things that happen on, in our life that are just out of nowhere. Um, I don't know if any of you guys have lost anybody from COVID or gotten, have just your family members gotten sick, but you know, whatever season you're in, whatever you're facing, the tears that you sow will reap a harvest of joy. In Revelations 21, 4, it says, He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. It's okay if you're depressed right now, but God doesn't want you to stay in that. He wants to take you out of the miry clay and place your feet on the solid rock of Jesus Christ. Just like David, he had seasons where he said, why is my soul so downcast? But he put his hope in God. 
Don't stay in that place of depression, but put your hope and joy in the Lord. You're not always going to feel it. Joy is not based on a feeling, but it's based on how much you trust God. So if you're being treated wrongly, rejoice in the Lord because you're being sanctified. If you're dealing with financial struggles, rejoice in the Lord because your faith is growing. If you have family members who aren't saved, rejoice in the Lord because your prayer life is growing. You can always rejoice in the Lord. It's a choice. Every day you can wake up and say, this is the day that the Lord has made. I may be dealing with a sin. I may need a victory in my life in this area, but I will choose to rejoice because God has given me breath in my lungs. He has given me a life and a purpose, and God will be faithful to finish the good work that he started in you. So no matter what you are facing right now, you can rejoice in the Lord and be thankful for the life he has given you. He has given you a, a unique purpose that no one else can walk in. And he has given you everything that you need. So, yeah, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Good evening, FBCI and those watching online. My name is Gabriella Black. If you will turn with me to Matthew 15, I'll be starting in verse 10. That's Matthew 15, starting in verse 10. And he called the people to him and said to them, Hear and understand, it is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but what comes out of the mouth, this defiles a person. Verse 18. But what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart, and this defiles a person. For out of the heart comes evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, and slander. These are what defile a person, but to eat with unwashed hands does not defile anyone. So my title for this message is, What Are You Eating? And I'm sure you've heard the saying, you are what you eat. And it's really true that what we put into our bodies gives us an effect. So if all we're eating is junk food, we're going to have a really bad effect. We're going to be tired. We're going to be sluggish. We're probably going to be more susceptible to getting sick. But if we're eating food that's rich in nutrients for our bodies, we're going to be strong and we're going to be energized and we're going to be healthy. And in the same way, our spiritual lives reflect the same truth. So whatever you feed, feed yourself is what you become. So what are you eating today? Are you feeding yourself the truth of God's word or are you full of yourself? So our words reveal the heart. Whatever we fill ourselves with will come out. Matthew 15, 18 in the Passion Translation says, But what comes out of your mouth reveals the core of your heart. Words can pollute, not food. Feeding the flesh will be evident in how you live your life. So in this passage, the Pharisees are just, they're coming after Jesus again. They're trying to get rid of him. They're trying to use whatever they can to take him out. And so they're coming to him and saying, don't you realize that your disciples aren't washing their hands after they eat? And for the Jews, this was a custom that you just don't break. But it's really sad because the Pharisees weren't concerned about the condition of the disciples. They weren't concerned that they could be sinning. All they were concerned with was how they looked in the view of the public. They were feeding themselves. And in doing so, they missed the Messiah. They missed Jesus because they were so consumed with their own will. So we need to choose to fill our hearts with the word of God. In God's eyes, what truly matters is the condition of our heart and not how many rules we follow. If we're so full of ourselves that we're living our own will, we won't be focused on him. Our hearts are only changed by the word of God. Secondly, our hearts reveal affection. Proverbs 4.23 says, Keep your heart with all vigilance, for from it flows the springs of life. And in the Bible, the heart is a metaphor for the core of a person. It's the source of our affection. And it's only natural for humans to be consumed with our selfish desires because from the moment we're born, we're born with this sin nature that compels us to do the things that are evil. We don't just automatically do the will of God. It takes great effort for us to give up what we want for God. That's why Christianity is so contrary to what the world is used to. It's telling us, 
Christianity tells us to crucify our flesh, to take up our cross daily and to follow after Christ. It's a really hard thing to do on our own, but God promises to help us. He doesn't make it impossible for us. He will guide us and sustain us through it all. And interestingly enough, our affections are the gauges of our soul. They tell us what we value. They tell us how much or how little we treasure a person or things and what we are in pursuit of. Our goal as Christians is to be people who walk and live in such a way that the world can see that we have Christ on the inside. If all we're doing is living for ourselves, no one's going to see a difference. And no one will want this Jesus we have if all they're seeing is a tainted Jesus. Our life's pursuit will be based on what we desire the most. Let's make our desire be God. And affection reveals our destiny. Jesus commands his disciples his disciples to choose eternal treasures which come out of a life seeking after him. Matthew 6, 20 through 21 says, But lay up for yourselves treasure in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So God is calling us to surrender our affections to him. And this word surrender means to willingly give something up. God's not forcing us to do anything here. It's our choice, our deliberate act to give up authority to him. I think sometimes we get this messed up view of God where he's an angry God and he doesn't want us to have fun anymore, that we have to live, leave this life of good things for a life of boredom. But that's not what Christianity is. Life with Christ is full of blessings and prosperity. It's going to be a crazy life, but it's going to be full and fun. When we give up our will, it's exchanging our sinful ways of destruction for a life of prosperity and success. God has called us to have relationship with him, and the only way we can have communion with him is to surrender what we want for what he wants. We must give up our desires for him. God is a loving God, and he showed us this incredible love when he sent his one and only son to die in our place, the place we rightly deserved, so that we could have restored relationship and communion with him. God wants to be a part of our lives, but he's not going to force us. Because he loves us, he gave us a free will to choose him. He will never force us to do anything. He will never force you to give up the throne or to seek him. He wants to be a part of our lives. We have to choose him. So who is on the throne of your life today, and what are you full of? Do you hold the throne or does Jesus? With ourselves on the throne, we'll always be searching for something to satisfy. This world may claim to offer satisfaction, but in fact, it'll just leave us dry. The only thing that will satisfy our our hearts and give us true success and fulfillment is when we surrender to Christ and live for him. So today, what will you choose to fill yourself with and what are you eating? Well, good evening, everybody, as if you haven't heard that yet. <laughs> I really appreciate everybody that came out here to show support for myself and for my, uh, with my fellow classmates here, giving us a little bit of a chance to uh, practice on you. <clears throat> Tonight, we're going to be reading out of the book of Proverbs, chapter 4. It's going to be verses 25 through 27, and I have allotted exactly 10 seconds for you to find that verse. <laughs> that is... The book of Proverbs, chapter 4, verses 25 through 27. And it reads in the King James Version, Put away from thee a froward mouth and a perverse lips uh, put far from thee. Let thine eyes look right on, and let thine eyelids look straight before thee. Ponder the path of thy feet, and let all thy ways be established. Turn not to the right, nor to the left. Remove thy foot from evil. I'll try not to put my hand in my pocket, Dr. Bell. Does anybody like to go for a walk? I really enjoy it. I try to do it every day, every day that I can. And where I live, there are no sidewalks. So when I go for a walk, I have to make sure that I'm looking straight ahead because straight ahead is where the cars are. 
Now, the right, and especially the left, is what I like to call not my business. Not my business is where people's houses are. And where people's houses are, there's all kinds of embarrassing things that you don't want me to see, and I don't want me to see either. <laughs> this has been kind of running parallel to what the Lord has put on my heart tonight. Uh, that is kind of some pitfalls that I feel that people uh, that are getting into the ministry might have a hard time with. Things that are not your business. The first thing that's not your business is how other people in the ministry, uh, how they conduct themselves, not your business. But what do I mean by that? Of course, it's going to be natural that you're going to find people that you want to uh, kind of emulate, that you look up to, people that you pattern yourself after. There's nothing wrong with that. But when you find yourselves in pursuit of making drastic changes to fit their pattern, that's when we take our eyes off where we're supposed to be, our business, and now we're in not our business. All we really have to do is kind of look at the world of art. I can go to a museum and I can find the Mona Lisa, that one of the most recognizable paintings in the entire planet. It's worth so much that it has no price. Or I can walk all the way over here, and here I can find a poster at Walmart. It's seven fifty. It's got the Mona Lisa on it. <laughs> What's the difference? The difference is one's real, and the other's a forgery. I can pattern myself to look after someone. I can emulate every mannerism that they have, and I can even impersonate their anointing. But I will be ultimately ineffective because I'm a fake. And that, pat, that, uh, that pitfall is really related to the next thing that I wanted to talk to you about. See, other people's ministries, those aren't any of your business either. Because you are unique, your ministry is also unique. And it is necessary to the kingdom of God. Because you don't know who God is going to put into your path that you have been handcrafted to get through to. And the manner that you are uh, ministering in, that's going to determine who it is that you're going to be able to minister to. Now, everybody knows someone who doesn't want to go to a church because they don't like the pastor or they don't like the music. It's too old-fashioned. And some of those things, though, some of those are petty. But other parts of it is them trying to find a place where they fit in, somewhere where they belong. If you are a homogenous mass with every other minister, how are they going to find that? Your uniqueness is an asset to the kingdom. There's nothing wrong with wanting to start a new program that you saw uh, at a, uh, another church. There's nothing wrong with uh, seeing an outreach and you just you feel like we should have that. But you've got to know who you are ministering to. We just look to see what Jesus had to say. Peter asked him about the disciple that he loved laying on his breast in John 21, 21 through 22. Peter, seeing him, saith to Lord Jesus, Lord, what shall this man do? And Jesus saith unto him, If I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? Follow thou me. What is Jesus actually saying? He's saying, you serve me, and he serves me. But he's not your business. He's mine. The last thing that I kind of want to talk to you about tonight is that when God has put a glorious purpose into your heart. He's not going to do something small because God doesn't do little. God made the universe. He made it in a couple of days. That's nothing. But those things, they don't come cheap in earth anyway. But how God provides for you, that's none of your business. I've heard way too many times the amazing amounts of money and substance that God has dropped in the people's laps just because they needed it. Every bar of gold in Fort Knox belongs to God. 
The earth is his, the fullness of it. Every pearl that is at the bottom of the sea, that belongs to God. The money that's in your enemy's wallet, that's God's. And the money in your wallet is his too. <laughs> it literally rains diamonds <laughs> on Neptune. Do you think that the amount of money that you need is anything compared to God? It is a pittance to the king. All we really need to do is trust him where he's going with it. If we keep our eyes to the front where the cars are, we'll know what's coming. But if we're looking at not our business, we're going to miss out on what God wants us to do. And it all boils down to trust. Do you trust that you are fearfully and wonderfully made? uniquely with a purpose god wasn't surprised when you showed up with the personality that you did your parents might have been surprised but god knew you were coming jeremiah 1 5 says before i formed thee in the belly i knew thee and before thou camest forth out of the womb i sanctified thee and ordained thee a prophet unto the nations you might say i'm not a prophet well, God knows that. Your calling was his. He put it on you. He knows just what you're supposed to be doing. You, not somebody else. Your ministry is not somebody else's. And the great things that he will provide for, those are his. Stay out of his business. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Brady Kelly. I'm from Steuben, Maine. But uh, if you'll turn in your Bibles to Galatians uh, chapter 1, starting with verse 6. Uh, and as you're turning there, uh, I'd like to say that through my life, I've learned that you cannot please everyone. You know, it's, it's something I used to try to do, but I actually found it's a lot easier to get under everyone's skin. So you know, I think like I'll, I'll, most of my classmates know that, you know, I've, I've learned to get really good at that. So, I mean, just, you know, if you can't be good at one thing, you know, find something else you're good at. So, but uh, Galatians chapter one, uh, starting in verse six, it says, I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is not another, but there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you, then we have preached you. Let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you that you have received, let him be accursed. For do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I still pleased men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. So even as I was uh, writing this sermon, I was struggling with, with pleasing men or preaching to please God. And I was like, God, why, why am I struggling with, like, with that? I, I try to go to the pulpit every time to try and please you. And I figured out, oh, my gosh, I'm trying to please Dr. Bell. Like, you know, I, I, like, you know, I go up to this pulpit on, on this public speaking night every homiletics class, and I realized, I am trying to please Dr. Bell, so you know what? It's not going to happen tonight. I am going to, I am going to please the Lord tonight, so, but, uh, but the uh, title of my sermon is People Pleaser, and that can be so easy for us, but in we, when I read verse 10, it first went over my head the first time I studied this, do I please men, or do I please God? One of the men that goes unnoticed in this scripture can sometimes be ourselves. Sometimes we can go in pleasing ourselves. A lot of the times when I read this scripture, I think of others, pleasing others. But one of those men can be me. So what gospel can we f sometimes find ourselves turning to? If you are anything like me, sometimes you will try to do it in your own power. 
So, so like, if a lot of my friends, close friends know me, there's something needs to be done. I want to do it for myself. I want anybody's help. That's a little bit of a conflict with Christianity because we're supposed to depend on Christ. But, you know, for me, I've actually struggled a lot with the religious work we find in the book of Galatians. So later on, you see Paul writing, and I think it's chapter 2, he says, Oh, foolish Galatians, you've turned from, from the freedom of Christ, and you're doing it in your own religious works. Which, even when you're in Bible school, it can still be easy, because there's a lot of work to be done. It's finals week. You know this. There's a lot of work. So for me, myself, and I, it's tough sometimes. But the gospel says that we need to deny ourselves. If we look in Luke chapter 9, verse 23, it says, Then he said to them all, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. We are to be submitted underneath Christ, which for me can sometimes be that constant struggle. But there's another category is, are you living to please others? That is not how we should live our life. Like when we preach this gospel, are we going up to this pulpit to try to sugarcoat what Jesus says? Or do we go up to this gospel to only give the, the good parts? But I tell you that we need to be people who preach the truth. There are far too many preachers of the gospel who aren't doing that. In uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4, it says, But as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, even so we speak not as pleasing men, but God who tests our hearts. Each and every single one of us who are in this place tonight have been and trusted with the gospel. That's, that's a very heavy word to be entrusted with something. The gospel is more valuable than anything else this word earth contains. This, this is the difference between life and death. And it is what we have been entrusted to share each and every single one of us, whether you're here attending this college or whether you are a follower of Christ, you are still entrusted with this holy truth. And it is so sometimes brushed off as something that's not that important. But, but James chapter 3 verse 1 says, My brethren, let not many of you become teachers, knowing that we shall receive a stricter judgment. It is something to be taken seriously not something to be brushed off the shoulders. It is important. But the way we need to live our life is not of pleasing of ourselves or pleasing of man, but it is to be in a life that is surrendered to Christ. And that is something that we can struggle with. Matthew chapter 11, verse 29, that says, take off your yoke and take on mine, for it is light Surrender to my will. That is where you will find the satisfaction you desire. But growing closer to Christ is not a result of harder work and trying harder and doing this. But it is surrendering more. Sometimes we say, God, I, I'm going through this, this process and I'm going through this struggle. And you keep finding yourself in this trap which turns into a loophole of trying harder, trying harder, trying harder. But, oh, foolish Brady, you need to surrender, surrender. But, so whether you are caught trying to please man or yourself, I just want to leave you with this one thing. It says we are here to please one, and that is Christ. And if you share this same feeling, so there's one thing that I think about often. That is when I do pass away, or the Lord comes home and takes us all, I think about going through those pearly gates and just seeing those nail-scarred hands wide open and having him embrace me and say, 
well done, good and faithful servant. Say much. Thank you for joining everyone online. I'm Nick Mercero for all of you who do not know me. And today's game day. All right, if you would go join me on the Luke 22, and we're going to be starting in verse 59, it's going to be going to 62. Again, that's going to be Luke 22, 59 through 62. About an hour later, someone else insisted, this must be the one because he is a Galilean too. But Peter said, man, I don't know what you're talking about. And immediately, while he was speaking, the rooster crowed. At that moment, the Lord turned and looked at Peter. Suddenly, the Lord's words flashed through Peter's mind. Before the rooster crows tomorrow, you will deny me three times and that you even knew me. And Peter left the courtyard, weeping bitterly. Well, I grew up playing sports, never very good. I went to a small town called Wales, and our team was absolute garbage but we tried that was the important part we definitely did try so we'd practice all the time we'd work at it but we never seemed to get better and i could never figure out why cannot we win we can't win and i don't understand why we were never winning but i noticed something as time went on when it came to game day we would forget the play and not only that but we would forget to look at our coach on the sidelines. We would be too focused in the game that we would forget what's going on on the outside. See, like Peter, he went and he went and denied Christ. But his original plan was not to go and deny Christ. It was to go and die with Christ. Now, Peter and John were rivals together. I know this because I was a twin and I grew up as a twin constantly rivaling we fought for our lives out here competing with each other john was called the beloved and peter had to tell jesus i love you three times and so i'm just saying if i was told i was the beloved i think i'm winning peter went and said the stupid thing to jesus he says, even if everyone else deserts you jesus i will never desert you and jesus is like that's not the plan that's not the play but Peter was convinced he must go and do this because of this rivalry he had with John. This made him lose focus of his play that he was going to run. See, fear got rid of his plan. We only notice that Peter starts to screw up when he lets fear get into him. As people going into the ministry, have we had times that we let fear hinder what God's plan is for us in our ministry? Have we gone and wanted to go evangelize to people? But the problem is, that fear starts to come into us. Even while I was sitting over there, the fear started to come over to me because I did not trust that God would do what he said to do because I stopped looking at the coach. Only then did fear start to slip in. And if Peter would have not done that, he would have not had to go away weeping bitterly because he would have completed the play. Even though we find ourselves caught up watching our coach, we can also watch the buzzer. See, Saul, during his battle against the Philistines, he had a play that he was supposed to be doing. He knew this was the play. Samuel had told to him, you're going to go, and in seven days, I'm going to come back, we're going to have a sacrifice, and then we will win the battle. See, this was the original play, but uh, being us like Saul sometimes, we wanted to do stuff early. Saul knew game days today, but he's watching that clock and he's saying, time's running out, Samuel. Where are you? You're not coming. I don't see you anywhere. Where are you? And so he went and he goes, oh, yes, I remember the play. I've got to offer my sacrifice. So he goes and offers the sacrifice. And then Samuel comes and he goes, what have you done? Have you ever had a coach yell at you and say, what have you done? You know you've messed up when a coach is saying, what did you just do? You just cost us the whole game. And so Saul knew he messed up. See, he wanted to play his own play. 
he knew that if he played his play, he would win. But it didn't happen that way. It's kind of like when you go for the buzzer shot right at the final. You're like, well, time's running out. So you shoot your shot. And then you're like, all of your teams all the way down the court. And they're like, why didn't you just pass it to me, guy? That's completely stupid of a play you just played right there. Stop watching the clock. Watch God. Watch your coach. See, Peter and Saul were running the wrong plays. But Jesus... Now, he gave us a secret play. We were told in Luke 24, 29, and now I will send the Holy Spirit just as my father promised. But stay here in the city until the Holy Spirit comes and fills you with power from on high. See, I imagine Jesus was like a coach. He's got his rolled up notebook, and he's like, all right, disciples, this is the next play you guys are going to have to run. All right? You're going to wait here. If you've ever been told by a coach to wait and you disobey waiting, they like to do this thing, at least in basketball, called suicides. And suicides where you run from one spot to the other, one spot, until eventually you end up right back where you started. It's pointless. It gets your sprinting down, but it's pointless. And us as ministers, if we don't wait on this secret play, we're going to be doing laps, going back and forth, back and forth, until we realize we're in the same spot where we started. Because Jesus told us to wait. And if you don't wait, you won't get filled. And if you don't have that filling, you won't have that power from heaven. And when you go into ministry, you need that power from on high if you are going to be successful in any sort of ministry. How many people have seen the movie Space Jam? Yeah, it's a good, it's a funny show. It's uh, Looney Tunes. But I think this is kind of how I imagine this scenario out, at least in my head. I think a little bit differently than most people. But this is how I imagine it. Uh, We're just these Looney Tunes, and they are on the brink of destruction of the world. And it all comes down to this one basketball game. And they have to go and play this basketball game to win the day. But they had some help from someone they were not expecting. And that was Michael Jordan. Now, Michael Jordan stands at a whopping 6'6". For me, I'm only six foot. I mean, I'd rather have someone that's 6'6 six, six standing on my team than someone like, you know, Joyson. <laughs> I don't think he's going to dunk it if that's the case. But if we imagine the Holy Spirit like Michael Jordan on our team, we're not going to lose. Because if we have Michael Jordan standing, it's not about our own ability, but it's about the ability that he has given to us. See, when he's on the court with us, we're not going to lose. Because game day's today. And when it's today, you best be winning. Because we got Michael Jordan. But you can't let fear come into you. When you let fear, like Peter, come into you, you start corrupting your play. And when you let doubt come in, like Saul, the vision in your plays are no longer going to be successful. But when you have the Holy Spirit inside of you, You will win the day for sure. Thank you, guys. These lights are bright. (laughs) Hi, everyone. Uh, My name is Julie. I am obviously a student here at Faith Bible College. (laughs) Uh, Thank you for allowing me to speak to you tonight. My classmates really rocked it. (laughs) Wow, just speaking about fear, I was uh, sweating over there. (laughs) I kind of needed that encouragement. (laughs) Um, I will be speaking to you tonight about believing the word of God. And my title is, I Dare You to Believe. And would you please turn with me to the book of Mark chapter 2, verse 1. That's Mark chapter 2, verse 1. And while you're finding the passage, I'd like to share some of the context. Uh, Jesus had just healed the leper and told the man uh, not to tell anybody about it. But how many know when you get healed, you tell everybody and that news travels fast. (laughs) Um, So the news spread around and people were coming to him from everywhere. When Jesus returned to Capernaum several days later, the news spread quickly that he was back home. Soon the house where he was staying was so packed with visitors that there was no more room, even outside the door. While he was preaching God's word to them, four men arrived carrying a paralyzed man on a mat. 
They couldn't bring him to Jesus because of the crowd, so they dug a hole through the roof above his head. Then they lowered the man on his mat right down in front of Jesus. Seeing their faith, Jesus said to the paralyzed man, my child, your sins are forgiven. But some of the teachers of religious law who were sitting there thought to themselves, what is he saying? This is blasphemy. Only God can forgive sins. Jesus knew immediately what they were thinking. So he asked them, why do you question this in your hearts? Is it easier to say to the paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven or stand up, pick up your mat and walk? So I will prove to you that the son of man has the authority on earth to forgive sins. Then Jesus turned to the paralyzed man and said, stand up, pick up your mat and go home. And the man jumped up, grabbed his mat and walked out through the stunned onlookers. They were all amazed and praised God exclaiming, we've never seen anything like this before. There are three observations I'd like to share from this text. The first is that Jesus is the source of their faith. He is the author and finisher of our faith. How was our faith created? Romans states that faith comes by hearing the word of God. John tells us that Jesus is the word. The word was God and the word was with God. He was with God in the beginning. All things were made through him and nothing was made without him. The word gave life to everything that was created and his life brought light to everyone. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness can never extinguish it. The enemy didn't make your faith, so the enemy can't destroy your faith when it's rooted in the source. The world didn't give it and the world can't take it away. I don't know what you're facing, but it is not bigger than my God. The devil is a liar. You are more than a conqueror through Christ Jesus. You will walk in freedom and victory. In Jesus' name, in whom the sun sets free is free indeed. The darkness will not extinguish the light in you because the enemy has no authority over you. In verse 7, the Pharisees think to themselves, this is blasphemy. Only God can forgive sins. What were they thinking? They saw him work miracles and they still doubted. There will always be doubters when God is about to work a miracle in your life. But here's the good news. Jesus is God, has always been God, always will be God. He does have the authority to forgive all of your sins. And what makes you think that he can't tell a paralytic to stand up and walk? He is the great I am. He is the alpha and omega, the beginning and the end. He's already done it for them and he will do it for you too because he is no respecter of persons. So we see that they had faith in Jesus. Now we can see that Jesus recognized their faith. He saw not just the paralytic's face, but his friends too. That tells you it matters who your friends are. This man and his friends heard about Jesus healing the leper. I have no doubt that Jesus knew he'd be coming. He's known what would happen from the beginning. He's known you'd be healed from the beginning and he has all the authority to do it. He's known you would need finances for your ministry and he's willing and able to do it. He knew you would have doubts. That's why he sent his one and only son, Jesus Christ, who is the way, the truth, and the life. He knows your every need and is willing to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that you could ever ask or think. I challenge you to start asking God for some crazy things because nothing is impossible with him. If you would only just believe. The paralytic and his friends lived by faith, not by sight. It reminds me of the centurion did when he didn't even need to see Jesus come to heal his servant. He knew Jesus would just speak the word and it would be done. Are we willing to believe God for crazy things even when we can't see it? What will we believe? Will we believe what we see or believe what God says? Faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. What are you hoping for? What are you believing for? Whatever it is, we have the authority to speak to it and the faith in God to believe for it. Get around some faith-filled people to believe with you. Finally, Jesus did something nobody had ever seen before because of their faith. Get ready for God to do some things that you have never seen before. <clears throat> so there's a uh, true story about a woman evangelist named Amy Semple McPherson. Uh, she was known for her healing ministry. <laughs> and um, she was preaching at a tent meeting. I'm just getting on the stage just to kind of give it more of an illustration. Um, so she was preaching at a tent meeting. I'm not sure if it was about healing or not, but the lamp burst in her face and she had third degree burn. So she runs off stage and she's about to quit for the night, but she hears these mockers as they were mocking throughout the night saying, ha, 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 this woman preaches healing, but she can't even heal herself. Well, that triggered her. 
So she runs back on the stage and she gets on the piano and she starts singing how the Lord is my healer, bless the Lord, hallelujah. And the crowd just watches as her face turns from lobster red to her normal fleshly color. I bet that was the first time those mockers had ever seen a miracle like that. Your miracle is not just about you. <clears throat> Excuse me, sorry. God made you for greater things. The creator looked at the disciples and said, greater things you will do. Jesus said, I have made the lame walk, but greater things you shall do. I believe, Greg, that you are going to walk again. You are going to stand up and take off running. Jesus said that I have healed the sick, but greater things you shall do. I have made the deaf hear, but greater things you shall do. I believe Jenny's hearing will come back in Jesus' mighty name. Jesus said that I have been, I have made the blind see, but greater things you shall do. I have set the captive free, but greater things you shall do. I believe that each of you will have a ministry so great the anointing will destroy every spirit of depression fear and addiction every time you preach jesus said i have cast out demon spirits but greater things you shall do hell is terrified every morning that you wake up why they don't know if this is the day that you will help set others free jesus said i have raised the dead but greater things you shall do i believe the next reinhard bonky is in this room i believe the next lester sumrall is in this room i believe the next amy semple mcpherson is in this room what did they do they preached the gospel they healed the sick they set the captive free they cast out demon spirits and raised the dead <clears throat> jesus said greater things you will do if you will just believe God only needs your yes, and sometimes that will take a lot of faith. And I'd like to close with this challenge. What will you believe? Thank you. Well, I must say, class, you did me proud. I was very, very uh, excited about hearing you preach tonight. <laughs>